Yep. So um, Andy and myself will watch. I've actually closed out the um, the waiting room. So my guess would be that they could just literally jump straight into this this main room here. And um, if if anybody is here that cannot see the link in the text chat of Zoom to the Google Doc, uh, go ahead and just um, chime in. And Andy is uh, yep just sending, sending it just in. Yep, cool, cool. So um, I can share my screen, but uh, let's see. Yeah, why not? I'm going to share my screen, but you can follow along, and then you'll have the freedom to scroll uh, up and down this Google Doc that I'm looking at. Uh, and I'm going to start from the top and just kind of work my way towards the bottom of it. It's only about uh, maybe 19, 20 pages. And everything that we're going to do today is basically uh, scripted out. And um, there's some hyperlinks within the document, and there's some links that go outside the document. So my goal is, in 15 minutes or less, basically give you a run through uh, to prepare you to jump into some role playing, where we're going to learn about um, the, this model that uh, Bill Joyner and uh, Stephen Joseph have uh, created called Leadership Agility. Now, the thing about this book is these are not agilists. These, these people are basically um, leadership training and coaching experts. And it's a sheer coincidence that the word agility um, appears in the title of their book. It is about people being able to pivot from one leadership style to another. And it follows something called um, stage stage-based development or leadership development. Um, and uh, let's see, whoever's highlighted, be careful not to delete. <laughs> this is supposed to be locked down um, so that we don't have an accidental deletion. Um, but you should be able to scroll up and down the document. Anyway, so returning to this topic, leadership agility, um, it's based on these model, uh, a model of stage, stages of human development that Robert Keegan also a popular author in the Agile community. Roger Keegan talks about, you know, children go through stages, uh, you know, as they go from, say, like infancy up to uh, adolescence. Then from adolescence, we continue to develop as, and evolve as adults. And um, in this book, it presents what, what are called post-heroic stages of human development, uh, five of them, where the, the top five, the, the top levels, um, are super, super rare, but when they are present in corporations, these corporations have been more profitable than their non-post-heroic um, leadership peers. And that's based on some longitudinal studies that have gone back uh, 40, 50 years done by Carnegie Mellon and USC. Um, literally like two to three million data points on tens of thousands of, of organizations. So I'm just gonna introduce you to that lens of looking at uh, leaders and how to coach, coach them. And then we'll also look at another model, if there's time, called competing values framework as it applies to corporate cultures and corporate leaders. So if you scroll with me uh, down the page, the part that says uh, meet 60 minutes, we're going to try to condense that just below 60 minutes so we let you get back to your families or whatever you're going to do with your evening on a prompt time scale. But basically it's this. We're going to go into breakout rooms. If there's more than, say, four or five of us, uh, in those breakout rooms there will be three people. So we'll be doing basically a coaching triad where there's a person who's going to be role-playing a corporate CEO, a leader named Ed, and I've got a background summary for that, and then scripts for Ed to read in response to the questions that the person that will place the coach is going to ask. And the, the, the questions that the coach is going to ask is also scripted. And this is lifted directly from the book and also from the workshop that Bill Joyner conducts a couple times a year uh, to certify people in this leadership agility uh, survey um, and analysis. Um, when we uh, look at post-heroic leaders or leaders of large corporations, there's basically four types. 
and I'm going to introduce those in just a few seconds um, in the pages below. But what the exercise is going to be is you're going to self-organize somebody who wants to role play Ed, the CEO. They raise their hand and then they click on one of the four types of Eds. So we call this like, you know, catalyst Ed or um, maybe uh, achiever Ed or expert Ed or conformer Ed. And uh, the person who decides that they're going to role play the coach, they're going to ask questions. All you have to do is read the script, but you're going to have to guess at the end of about maybe a 10 minute conversation, guess which Ed you're talking to. Are you talking to a conformer level leader, catalyst, expert, or achiever? And then, and then the observer is going to ask the coach, what evidence do you have from the conversation, what the person playing Ed said or did that leads you to believe that you're speaking to the type of leader that you think you are? And so it's kind of a chance to do some peer coaching or paired coaching as the observer. But really there's kind of two coaches there. And in real life, I can tell you from experience, being the, the second coach gives you an ability to not speak, but listen more and look at the kind of interaction and relationships that are in the room and make discoveries that you probably wouldn't have the spare brain cycles to do if you're busy speaking as the coach. So this will be a rare experience to, if you haven't been in a coaching triangle or a paired coaching scenario, this will be a great exposure to it through this exercise. And then when about 12 minutes has gone by, if we go into the breakout rooms, we'll bring everybody back from all the different breakout triads and we'll see what we learned and how we want to change the next round of breakouts and role play. And so I'll introduce that then. If there was time, we're not sure. We'll see how quickly we can move. Sometimes we can fit three separate rounds of this breakout and kind of a guessing game, which Ed am I talking to? And at the very end of the entire exercise, we can go through something called the debriefing cube, which is an open source document, teaches you how to debrief participants in a, a learning experience like a role play or any kind of other agile game. If you remember, there was probably a facilitator of an agile game and they asked questions that led to discoveries that nobody who played was anticipating, not even the facilitator. So the real juice of experiential learning happens in the debrief. And the strongest tool I know is that debriefing cube, the debriefingcube.com. Um, that we'll, we'll get a, just a taste of maybe today. And then next, there's the competing values framework. I won't go into depth now, but that's another way, another lens that we can look through uh, to maybe discover something about leadership styles. If you go with me then to the next page, which is, let's see, I believe, no, it's not showing me, uh, a leadership challenge. I think I'm on page five. Oh, no, I'm on page four. Um, on page four, there's the background to this role play. It introduces Ed, the CEO, and why he just became the CEO. Go ahead and read that uh, just before the role play. And now I'm going to introduce on page five, leadership agility overview, which is the four leadership agility levels. Now, one thing about uh, leadership uh, evolution or growth is it follows the same path in all humans. Before somebody becomes, for example, an achiever leader, they will have gone through a growth uh, path that went from conformer and then expert and achiever. And then, you know, uh, eventually maybe they grow into become a catalyst. The thing is that once you've grown through a stage, it's always there for you. It's a skill set that you can fall back onto as you see fit for what the context uh, requires. And I've just kind of given the brief, a brief profile here. For example, the conformer, it's got a picture of a hyena because a hyena is kind of like, to me, a spirit animal that represents 
what a conformer does in the wild, meaning in, in the real world. Most people hit the conformer stage of their personal or professional development when they're in high school. So if you think of all the cliques that formed in high school and the ways that people behaved in those cliques, social status is tantamount and groupthink orientation is roughly like the default way that they, that they behave. And mostly unconsciously, people are driven by their sense of hopes and fears of how they're going to be judged by others. And so moralizing happens a lot in that space and some negotiation and manipulation between conformers happens quite a bit too. But when push comes to shove, a conformer believes that leaders are people who are followed because they're either admired or they are feared. And so when they are the leader, they, they behave that way. So they, they might throw their weight around a little bit. The next level that a leader would progress to in their evolution is an expert. And this is, in humans, usually something that happens like in college as you begin to acquire a lot of specific field specific technical information, then that becomes the end all. And so an elephant never forgets. Um, in this case, um, the, the thing about the elephant is that they're very tactical. They try to find a technical solution for everything. Complex problems doesn't matter. Human problems doesn't matter. Technical solution is the hammer that they pound all nails with. Everything is a nail to the technical hammer that an elephant sees. And they're also very loyal. Uh, there's, there's lots of admirable qualities about an expert leader, but at the end of the day, they believe that they're the leader because they are the most informed, they hold all the cards, they are the smartest bulb, in the brightest bulb in the room, and they expect that that's what all leaders are. Um, the next level, as the expert possibly grows further, is the achiever. Here's the thing about hippos that you might not know. Hippos can be not just carnivores, but cannibals. Hippos have eaten other hippos. Hippos will attack anything that gets between it and its cub. That's what you call a baby hippo. And if you get into a hippo's territory, they will kill you. There is no escaping the wrath of a hippo. A hippo is a killing machine. You do not want to anger a hippo or cross a hippo. They go on the war path. And here's the key. It's not personal. They don't care about you. They have a goal. They want to achieve a goal, and that is the only thing that matters, especially to an achiever. So achievers want very clear targets. They want to achieve a goal. Anything that gets between them and their goal gets eliminated. There's no emotion about this. It's just about getting things done. They are unstoppable. You do not want to get run down by a hippo or an achiever. It's not personal. It's totally professional to them. The next stage then is the catalyst. The catalyst is much like a giraffe in that giraffes have very long necks and their vantage point is higher than any other animal. They're looking far off into the horizon. They're very strategic in their thinking. They do have horns. They seldom use them. And even if they do use them, their horns don't tend to do irreparable harm. But of course, the, being a catalyst, they were once a hippo. They were once an elephant. They were once a hyena. They know how hyenas think and hippos and elephants, but they're very visionary. They're soft-spoken. They hold space. They don't crowd the conversation. They're majestic. They have an attachment to purpose. Everything that you admire about a giraffe, I think you would admire about a catalyst leader. So as I've been talking, before you ask any questions, I'm asking you, who in your life did you think of as I described these animals and these leaders? If you could just share a one, maybe two minute story without telling us what type of animal that leader was, somebody in your career that clearly came up in your mind as you were hearing me describe these different leaders, what can you share with me?
Hey, this is Ravi. Um, mm -hmm. I recently uh, had an opportunity to talk to uh, an uh, CEO. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he was part of uh, ENG uh, Europe, Germany. Right? And he was mm -hmm. approaching in a very tactical uh, way. Uh, say, for example, as a CEO, you expect to have a, a different type of discussion, but he was talking more from a technical standpoint on how to solve or how what kind of um, program or the code that you write. Very, very tactical, all the way to the, probably he's very passionate about that. Uh, but those in few conversations, like, uh, or in all the three or four conversations which I had with him, it was more of technical in nature or some technical nature mm -hmm. uh, came up during our discussion. Perfect. Thank you, Revere. So now, think about what kind of leader you think you just described and type either the animal or the leader's stage in the text chat when I say go. We're just going to guess. We're going to guess if we can all agree on what kind of leader Revere just described. So, Start typing now, and then when I say go, press return. Ready? One, two, three, go. Who'd like to guess? You can just call it out. What do you think? What kind of leader do you think you heard Revere describe? This is a calibration exercise. I'll go ahead and guess. I've entered it into the text chat. It sounded like Revere describes an expert leader to me. Who, who thinks that they heard something different? It would be okay if you, if you found something that sounded different from an expert in Revere's story. So, I'll give my evidence for thinking that Revere, for thinking that Revere describes an expert. Revere mentioned that there was something tactical about the way he approached problems, and he also mentioned that he was looking, he was using uh, technical approaches. And so that kind of tips me off. Maybe this was an expert leader that he's describing, and. If, is Revere still on? I don't know if his picture dropped out. I don't know if you can still hear me. Revere, are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. The network is slow and uh, it's up. Uh, yeah. No problem. So uh, what, 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 what type of leader did that CEO seem like to you? Did it seem like an expert or something else? He's definitely an expert. Uh, uh, and his expertise come from the, uh, the way he perceived to solve a problem uh, and mm -hmm. he, he wants to use this technology to solve some of many of his problems actually um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's what I think. Um, mm -hmm. Cool so as you can see we're, we're, we're calibrated pretty tightly. Um, when I listened to the description that Revere gave um, the words that he was using resonated with my idea my model of an expert leader. And there's nothing wrong with that. I can, I can see that uh, that type of leadership style will be effective in certain situations. And there will be other situations in which maybe a different leadership style would be effective. Does anyone have a memory, a real life instance of a leader in any one of those four different leadership styles that I described? Conformer, expert, achiever or catalyst? A one to two minute description would be enough or we can just jump into the role play. I wanna see how comfortable you are with, with this type of lens at looking at leadership. Once Does anybody again, have uh, any questions? Um, uh -huh. Liberty to talk. Uh, mm -hmm. I may have to drop off in, uh, let's say, another 10, 15 minutes, but I'll make you best use of this time. Um, mm -hmm. I have seen, uh, there are two, two observations or two kind of thoughts going on. One is, mm -hmm. he, as a person, right, like at a given point in time, they may react in a certain style, uh, or it may not be the same person 
uh, sticking to a certain uh, uh, quality. That is one, which, which means that a person could exhibit different types of things in a different time uh, time frame. Uh, and uh, so it is really difficult for me to observe specifically set my sign that this is you are specific to this or you are in this category right that is that's still have to be come through a, a experience i believe uh, the next one uh, is about uh, since you asked the question to answer the question on uh, i feel my wife is a typo uh, type in nature where she oh, okay. nature, decide outcome uh, doesn't care about uh, how many people how others think all the stuff but i, I feel uh, she is of that nature Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, businesses benefit from people that are very results driven as an achiever would be. And, you know, when we, when we see a lot of evidence that can, that confirms that belief, uh, this person might be an achiever kind of a leader style. Um, then there's a little bit of predictability and ways that we can interact with them that helps them uh, both, you know, achieve business outcomes that they want, and also maybe even grow to the next stage of development. If they're asking us to coach them, I don't ever recommend what we call stealth coaching, which means coaching somebody, even though they never asked you to. <laughs> it's a really bad idea. Most people, they want to be respected. If they want coaching, they'll set up a coaching contract or a coaching relationship with you, which is a great thing. Then then coaching conversations are appropriate and productive. Um, and so in this scenario, in this role play that we're about to do, um, I think we have, we, if, if we have six people, we have just enough to do two, two groups of three. Uh, the role play is in, is in groups of three. And then we can come back and um, someone in each breakout group, someone needs to be the ed and they need to freely choose, secretly choose, which ed script they're going to read in response to the questions that the person who's coaching is going to ask. And then the third person will be the observer who only asks questions at the end and directs their questions to the coach. Why do, what type of leader was ed? Why do you think that? And here's what I think. And what did we learn from the exercise? So uh, we'll put about 12 minutes on the clock and go to the breakout rooms uh, if we're all ready. If, as you can see in the Google Doc, um, there's both an introduction to the leadership styles. There is a background for Ed. I don't think you need it, but if you feel like you do, it's about three paragraphs long. You can read the scenario of how Ed just became CEO. And then the rest of the pages are scripts for Ed to read, the coach to read, and the observer. Any questions before we start? Hey, sorry to, uh, I may have to excuse myself. Um, I had to take my kid to the soccer. She's behind okay. me. Yeah, so oh, uh, good. I will be in a listening mode uh, because I'll okay. be driving. But yeah, sure. thanks for that. Too. John, do you, you want bet. to okay. keep in one group then, given that? Yeah. Okay. For sure. Yep. Sounds okay. Good. I will set that up. Here. So, who would like to volunteer to be the ed? All you have to do is read, pick a script and read a script. And we're going to be able to rotate if we do more than one round. So you don't have to worry about being locked into it the whole day. John, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. kind of joined in a little bit late and uh, I, uh -huh. I lost the context at the beginning. So for me to participate in this uh, exercise, it's going to be a little bit tougher, but uh, I okay. would definitely love to observe and, and understand okay. and learn from it. Okay. So how about if you take on the observer role? You won't have to speak until the very end. And we still need somebody to be a coach and we need somebody to be an ed. Can be and Andy, an go ed. ahead and pump. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, can you hear okay. me? Yeah. Okay. And so when we when we pick a script, we're picking one of the sections like with something land. 
Like we're taking one of those sections and we're reading that part? Exactly. You're exactly correct. Okay. And don't tell us which one you picked because we're going to guess after the conversation. <laughs> That's why I left that blank. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, okay. uh, and, and so the coach is always asking funny. the same questions. Correct. Yes. I think there's a bit of a lag, so, so I apologize for overlap. <clears throat> no problem. We're going to just adapt with whatever the internet presents us today. <laughs> and um, who would like to just read? It's the same questions regardless, but you are going to be the person who guesses what kind of ed you're talking to. And so anybody want to volunteer before I volunteer you? Who's going to do it? Who wants to be the coach? You read the questions and then just guess. That's all that's going to happen in the role play. Awesome. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, do you have so, but what do I get the? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. Oh, okay. So is that being shared in the chat? Yeah. Let me. Yeah. Yeah. Share that again. Yep. Thank you, Joshua, for stepping forward for that. And um, there's basically going to be um, in that Google document a description of four different styles of leadership, and um, just really quickly, I'll, I'll I'll tell you that it's. There's a conformer type of a leader who we, we call them like a hyena, just a spirit animal that you can associate with them. There's a, an expert, which we call an elephant. This is a person that uses a technical approach to solving all problems. And then there's a, an achiever, which we call a hippo. And they just are very results driven. Um, they can be ruthless at times, but they just get the job done. That's the achiever. And then the fourth kind of leader is called a catalyst leader. leader. And they're more interested in long-term strategy, developing the leadership skills of others around them, and achieving results by handling complex problems in an indirect way. So those are the four leadership styles you want to be listening for as you just read the question and listen to the person who's Ryan. Ryan will be role-playing Ed. And then... Arshad, Arshad, would you be okay with being the, the observer? So you're like a backup coach to Joshua, and you're just going to ask Joshua, what, what, do you, what does he think uh, he learned from, from Ed? What kind of leader is Ed? What evidence does Joshua have for, being, for thinking or guessing that, Ed, that Ryan is a certain kind of leader? Sure. Awesome. Thank you, Arshad. And so yeah, with that, that yep. Uh, everybody, find your, find your page in the Google document that gives you either, if you're Ed, your, your, your responses, if you're the coach, Joshua, the questions, the coach's questions page, and if you're the observer, you go to Observerville, I just named them different lands, because this is a safari, um, the observer, and, and feel free to take handwritten notes if you want, but really listen to Ryan as he, as he reads the script for whatever kind of ed leader he chose. And I think, Joshua, you kick it off with the first question from Coachville. Hey, uh, so I'm going through the document here, so I believe I'm supposed to start reading from the leadership agility overview, right? Yeah, just uh, if you just skim that, I, I kind of verbally gave you the overview of, of the four different leadership styles. Um, and we can all guess together. Don't, don't feel pressure to be right. But um, if you scroll down on, I'm going to find Coachville. Uh, See FAQs about development stages. Is that what I'm supposed to read out? No, it's um, a little bit further down. Uh, it's page nine. Can you go to page nine of 18 in that Google Doc? Yes, I'm right there on page nine. First off, Coachville is the top of it. Joshua. Okay, got it. <laughs> yep, got it. So, yep. So, those are your questions, and you're just going to read the question, let Ed respond, and then read the question. But be listening to what kind of leader Ed sounds like to you, whether it's a okay, conformer so or listen to. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm supposed to ask the questions and listen out to what kind of leader he is. That right? That's exactly Perfect. it. Yep. So I'll 
if you just give me the go ahead, I'll go right ahead and start with the first question here. So how okay. are you doing at your new leadership role? This company has lost its edge, but I've always respected their tradition of excellence and innovation. I envision a company that will not only regain its status as an industry leader, but also become a benchmark for other industries, a participative, a participative high performing organization. That's a great place to work. To do that, people need to learn to lead and to manage this place in new ways. Okay. okay. The answer. So I'm going to ask the next question. So how did you get started? I got to know the leaders. I walked around a lot and I started following some social networks. I sought out innovators, uh, sorry, innovators, uh, learned what they're doing and gave them some encouragement. I also met with key uh, customers, including some former customers. And I've asked leaders and others to do the same. Then we all shared uh, together what we learned. Excuse me. So what did you focus on first? I held a two day offsite with my leaders and some of their people to surface issues. I reiterated our goals to achieve profitability and industry leadership and said to achieve these goals, we need everyone to contribute their best work and ideas. We only touched the tip of the iceberg, but it was a productive two days and I have ideas to carry forward. Sustaining industry leadership takes more than innovative know-how and can-do attitude. I believe that the best companies are those that intentionally set out to establish a culture based on participation, mutual respect, and straight talk. I think it's going to help change the way that they lead their own teams and a step towards creating a new culture. Uh, so what's, what's it been like working with your leadership team? In many ways, it's like a laboratory. I'm trying to develop a leadership team that can serve as a prototype and a participative culture. This is so important that I try to spend a few hours a week with the team engaging in important strategic and operational issues. They see I can be influenced by their ideas and they know it's not just a game to get their buy-in. Have you run into any particular challenging problems so far? I wanted to set up a way to get meaningful input from a cross section of people at all levels. The leadership team batted the idea around a while then dove in. A few weeks ago, we started a series of focus groups to capture ideas from a broad cross section of employees. We also tasked a couple of groups to get ideas from outside stakeholders. This process is generating a lot of positive energy, which we really need right now. We also need to re-examine our business processes, especially product development. We've also got some huge opportunities to make our manufacturing processes more efficient and more environmentally responsible at the same time. A lot of cost savings are possible. Have you had any especially challenging conversations with your team? I think of several. I've been coaching some leaders and asked them for feedback on my leadership approach. After some trepidation, some people actually spoke up. The most challenging were meetings with one leader. I saw that we weren't going to turn this place around if he stayed in his position. I asked him if his perspectives, oh, sorry, I asked him his perspective and gave him room to respond. Soon he acknowledged that he was in way over his head. After we reached that level of honesty, I said, if you could invent any job, what would it be? Turns out he loves the client work over leading people. So we were able to restructure his role. Yeah, that's the last question for me, I believe. Right, John? Mm -hmm. That's right. And so Observer, you have a question or some questions for the coach, Joshua. Yeah, I was actually wondering about what type of leader uh, do you think uh, in, in this particular role play you notice this individual is? Um, I think he falls into the category of the catalyst. Uh, I feel like he's very visionary because he tends to uh, care more about um, the high level picture of the team's performance likes to get feedback and he likes to walk uh, team members or stakeholders through whatever process they're trying to uh, re-engineer or improve on. And he tends to get uh, look for validation before moving on to the next stage. I also feel like uh, he believes in uh, transformative change through uh, collaboration. And I believe he likes to have the tough conversations and figure out how to move forward with regards to um, resolving any issues or any challenges going on or miscommunication between his team. 
And I also believe that uh, he's very articulate and innovative, inspiring vision, and he likes to bring uh, people to transform vision into reality. Yeah, I and and John, I think uh, I agree with him. Uh, as a, I I have seen uh, in this particular situation two attributes to this leader. One is the mm -hmm. catalyst as well as the achiever. So it's mm -hmm. not just one individual, um, you know, aspect that you're looking at, but you're looking at all of them combined, and and the, mm -hmm. the genuinity of the individual shows that there is a care in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you you all really nailed this role play, um, and I uh, I have to say it, it's um, for, first of all. Well, uh, let's just confirm with with Ryan. Uh, would you like to tell them what leader, which Ed you were being? Yep, you guys nailed it. Catalyst. Yeah, catalyst. Yeah, um, and I'm I'm just curious. Uh, so Joshua, were you taking notes, or did you just um, give that uh, feedback uh, to Arshad from memory. Um, so I kind of wrote some things down. Uh, I noticed how we handled the everyday tasks and I put that down as a general heading. And I noticed how he was interested in engaging the stakeholders. And I also noticed how uh, he was interested in having um, tough conversations from the questions I asked him mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and then directing people and acting on pretty much as the catalyst and making sure that he's catalyzing change in, in the enterprise he's working at. So I, I awesome. took, if I could show you my notes, it's like little docs I wrote down, like little pointers now. And as your, soon as I scrolled up is, on the Google Doc and I left. Oh, sorry, your, your uh, background my background is, is, is called. Yeah. Okay, my boy, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll fix that right now. <laughs> But Josh is well well said though. Sorry, Joshua. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah Josh, you did an excellent job. So I'm actually yeah. outside the house right now. I went to A and W looking for better internet signal because I feel like there's something <laughs> going on the Wi-Fi all over the world. Improvising. I mean, it's not very excellent. it's not very secure, but <laughs> it's something <laughs> fine. Yeah. No, so I, 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 was, I just wanted to see your notes. I, I know that you're holding your notes to the screen and, and the the background washed it out, but Oh, wow. That's all. So, okay. Very efficient note taking. Excellent. So at, at this stage now, we, we can, we can do a couple of things. We can do another round where people change roles. Uh, we could do another round where Ed stays in his role. So Ryan is still Ed, but he chooses a different leadership style. Or we could go off script rather than just reading out answers. We could make them up on the fly. Or we could have more conversation about leadership styles and I could introduce uh, the conflicting values framework. We've got about another 12 minutes left to the top of the hour. So which path would you like to take? This is a choose your own adventure approach to the workshop. I pick continue um, with the discussion uh, rather than having mm -hmm. this role play at this moment uh, mm -hmm. because of the mm -hmm. time limit as well as more knowledge can be transferred that way in this short given time. Very cool. Um, is anybody here familiar with the conflicting values framework? Anybody heard those words before? It's a different book, different author, different paradigm, but there's some interesting parallels. So if you go to, I think it's page three on that Google Doc, you're gonna see this exact same book cover. And if you look very closely in that book cover in the document, you're gonna see like a metric ton of information, again, about leadership styles. Now, the thing about conflicting values framework is it's been around for decades. There's dozens of books written about it. Another one, just for your reference, I got this for probably like a buck 50 off of Amazon used. Um, this is also about conflicting values framework. It's usually used to categorize corporate cultures, large organizations. The interesting thing about this particular book is it's drawing the connection between apex level leaders and the cultures that they cause 
inside of large organizations. And so what you're going to see here is in the descriptions that I gave for the four leadership styles on the right side, I actually used a color and one of these quadrants to describe the different leadership styles. So the giraffe catalyst is yellow and the hippo, no, the elephant is red, hippo is blue, the hyena is green. And we would, you know, some people might think, well, the hyena is the least developed according to the leadership agility model and Robert Keegan's, you know, stages of human development. But like uh, I think it was Arshad was saying, there are virtues to being green. If, if you look at the evolution of an entire for-profit organization, one pattern that you might discover is in the beginning, as a startup, very small organizations are generally following an entrepreneurial style of leadership because the founder was the first employee. They set the tone. And as they grow, it becomes like a tight-knit family. This is sometimes called the clan quadrant. As that family begins to, to grow and sometimes quarrel, rules start being codified and norms start getting entrenched, and it becomes very hierarch hierarchical, very rules-driven. And then usually those rules create a bureaucracy that gets mired in process, and so a backlash happens that focuses on the customer or the market, the achiever. So actually, in the, in the competing values framework, the succession goes in, the in this direction, counterclockwise. And without an entrepreneurial type of person starting the organization in the first place, you don't have, you don't have an organization to belong to or pick up a paycheck from. So each one of these leadership styles is absolutely indispensable. And as Arshad was saying, they layer on each other. They don't just go away because you became more highly evolved. All of them have their place. All of them are effective in certain contexts. So now having said that, think back as I was describing those different stages of organizational development, organizational culture, what memories came up for you? Just describe it one or two minutes. What organizations have you worked in that were one of these four colors? The culture. Have you ever seen one shifting? In. Yeah? Come again? Uh, so I feel like uh, where I currently work, I work as a freelancer right now, a freelancer agile coach. I uh, currently mm -hmm. got brought into the team uh, and the name of the company I would not share right now because they're pretty much a okay. startup and they're working on Good. various projects on getting um, a go-to market strategy on various um, platforms you're trying to build, working with different developers. And due to the times we're in, I had to collaborate with various people all over the world because they one of the um, companies that have developers in India working on a particular project and for cost saving reasons. They also have another team in Africa, West Africa. So I got brought on the team but uh, what I believe that the whole uh, enterprise architecture is about is building a clan because they want to collaborate as a startup and also manage costs by getting people from different backgrounds to buy into the projects they, they're working on right now. I also believe that they need a lot of mentoring. Uh, I'm not the only agile coach on board, um, but I feel like the company figured they will need about two or three. So about two and one staking the team we wrote and we do a lot of agile coaching. So I believe that I, I, I currently work with uh, this company uh, and it's a clan kind of culture. And the orientation is to collaborate. We do a lot of virtual stand-up meetings and working on different time zones. And we have to figure it out, but everybody um, actually adheres to the Canadian time and works with the EST, Eastern um, Toronto time. 
So uh, yeah, that's all been currently working the clan culture type. Cool. And who is the, or not who is, what is the leadership style of the CEO, would you say? Do they fit the description? Uh, I was, if I, what, would you call them a, a facilitator, mentor, and team builder? Uh, I, I will call it uh, a team builder because he's currently out there looking for people who fit into his, uh, his standards and his collaborative spirit. So I feel like he's currently a team builder within a young team at the moment. And I'm, I'm just reading right out of the yellow quadrant, which is the, the clan culture, which you mentioned. Um, and the theory of effectiveness, you can see this in the Google Doc, the theory of effectiveness yeah. in this cl clan culture is human development and high commitment to produce effectiveness. Yeah. Seen it. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, do you, what do you think about either the leadership agility uh, model, those four leader uh, styles, or the competing values leadership framework? Is this something that would help you if you were to be a coach and the CEO says to you, I want to move from one of these quadrants to a different quadrant as the company culture and personally it myself as a leader? Would this be useful? And if so, in what ways? How would you use it? Yes, I believe this will be very useful because uh, it pretty much shows me the four quadrants that most companies work on, like you mentioned earlier, they all build on each other. And it will help me explain or engage my CEO better in regards to what the different levels are, how long they've been there for, the level of effectiveness, uh, how much people have been able to um, gain from understanding where they stand in this quadrant and definitely also present some sort of visualization to show us where we are as is and where we want to move to to very cool what um what aspects of leadership agility um or the competing value framework uh are you curious about or concerned about uh, I think it's the second quadrant that says hadocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of new to that word. Uh, I, I feel like there's a simple word for that that I'd like to learn today. What exactly sure. does that culture type mean? Yeah, so ad hocracy basically means like you're darting around to put out fires. You're extremely reactive to whatever's going on around you. There's not a lot of methodo methodology or um, method to the madness, so to so to speak. It's it's more fluid, and um, you don't you don't necessarily know what you're going to do moment to moment. The flip side of adhocracy, because that might sound kind of scatterbrained. It might sound a little bit like um, chaotic, but the the positive side of adhocracy is there's a wait and see attitude. There's an inspect and adapt attitude that's very empirical. So I always want to look at these as the cup is half full, it's not just empty. And there's a reason why these different cultures or these different leadership styles actually are sustainable at scale in large organizations over many, many years. But um, yeah, ad hocracy just means the rule of the moment rather than the rule of the majority or the rule of hierarchy and rules or the rule of the customer is always right. Those are different, different takes on how, how I organize my world. Now that you mentioned John, that, I mean, uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. so I was just going to ask, I mean, is the ultimate goal to reside in one of these quadrants or to take up space in all of them as a balanced approach or so truth be told, I let my customer decide what their goal is. When I, when I present them with, I'll call this a lens, okay? It's a lens to look through reality at. I'll say, okay, so um, Mr. CIO, uh, here's the lens that I look through reality at. What do you see here 
that might appeal to you. And he might say, well, first of all, John, I want you to run a survey and find out which culture are we? How deep into one or the other are we? And so there's a tool that I can send out, like, you know, maybe 20 questions it can be filled out in about five minutes by somebody. And then we get a score. It makes like a spider chart on this, on this box. And then the CIO might say, you know, we need to be more focused on the market. Our competition could eat us alive if we don't, if we don't perform better in the market. Or they might say, we need to shift to a blue ocean. We need more entrepreneurial thinking, new product lines, new industries, new demographics in our customers. So then, then I'll start a conversation with, okay, so as a leader, how can you manifest those behaviors and those thoughts such that the rest of the organization can follow your lead to be thinking and behaving in ways that resemble a bias towards green or a bias towards blue or a bias towards yellow. And I'll let them actually answer those questions, fill out a, plan, a, a coaching plan to say, okay, by such, such a time, I want to have made progress in my own personal growth to reflect the culture that I want to take root here more strongly. And then we can just do another poll again and find out, did you move the needle at all? Did you move the needle in the opposite direction? What do you want to do about that? So it, it, it becomes the fuel for coaching conversations. Great questions. Well, we're at one minute after, and it's been absolutely phenomenal for me to observe uh, the role play. You, all three of you did wonderful. Uh, Joshua, um, I'm envious of you. Uh, you've, you've got a great situation to be coaching in, obviously a lot of talent uh, as an Agile coach, and so um, hope to see you again soon. This has been really fun. Thank you for having me, by the way, Naz. No, no thanks, thanks. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thanks. See you soon. Take Thank care. you, Ryan, hey. Joshua, John, yeah. Good evening. Andy. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye. Nawaz. Thank you. Thank you very Take much. Care. Be well, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.